Thank you. So, let me first thank the organizers for giving me the chance to speak here. Uh, my name is Luis Benet. I will speak about a simple model for the location of Saturn's F ring, and this is joint work together with Angel Jorba from the Barcelona, University of Barcelona. So let me describe a little bit first what's Saturn F ring. So Saturn F ring was actually discovered uh, while a pioneer was flying by uh, close to Saturn. And it was uh, a good, say, discovery because it was a narrow, eccentric, sharp-edged ring which happened to have, was the, oops, was the first example which had the Shepard uh, moons uh, around there. And the theory of Shepparding was formulated a few years back just to account for the discovery of the, of the rings of Uranus. So that was a great discovery. <coughs> Until it came clear that the actual ring was not located where the theory was predicted. So the torques exerted by, the, by, the, by Prometheus and Pandora were not balancing uh, in the place where the ring was located. Now, the ring turned to be extremely interesting, uh, and this describes it a little bit. So, it had a lot of structure as a, uh, a long, uh, I mean, as a mutual structure. So, from time to time, it was having this sort of evaporating parts. From time to time, it was having these sort of patches. From time to time, these patches were sort of having some structure with respect to uh, to continuity and also changes in the brightness and the width. And it was not clear what was actually causing this thing. Now, eventually it became quite clear that there were short time effects which were sort of unstable in a given sense, I will show it right now, and also some uh, long time effects which uh, are not actually unstable. So let me show you a beautiful real. Uh, uh, where is the mouse? Ah. Thing uh, provided by Cassini, which will end shortly its mission time. So there you have Prometheus. And you can see that now this sort of structure is appearing after its pass. And also a Pandora causes some other things in the ring. So the ring, uh, more or less, we're speaking about few hours, probably four hours of real time. So this, this phenomena happens in a very short time scale. The, uh, the scale for the, the period of motion of Prometheus, the innermost moon, is about 17 hours. So it is really short time dynamics. This uh, phenomena, by the way, this, uh, the appearance of these gaps was a prediction. It was predicted before being measured. <coughs> so this uh, mosaic shows a little bit a, a more global picture where you can see that, I mean, things are changing. I mean, it is about a month from uh, uh, each mosaic, but you see that things are changing quite drastically. There are changes uh, along the, uh, I mean, the azimuthal direction, but also changes on the radial direction. What it happens not to change, however, is actually the ellipse that is fitted to these, all these pictures. It actually happens to be so robust that from the very beginning of the measurements or observations, essentially the same ellipse has been actually the one that he is given the, the orbital elements of the ring. And this is, I think, very nicely summarized in this quotation. So despite of the fact that the Saturn F ring has lots of short time scale on stabilities, it maintains over uh, decadal timescales the shape of a freely processing eccentric incline ellipse. And this is a point which is not understood. And this is what we, uh, we are addressing uh, more or less in this talk. <coughs> <coughs> so this is a very crude model, as I said. Uh, the first thing that we are assuming is that particles do not influence uh, the ring particles, first of all, do not collide and will not influence uh, the motion of whatever is surrounding Saturn. So this allows actually to separate an n-body part for Saturn and its uh, moons and whatever else, and then the ring part 
as actually a single uh, point particle, massless point particle. We also assume that the whole ring is not influencing the, the motion of the, of the moons, and this is actually sort of realistic in the sense that the, the whole mass of the rings is estimated to be below the, the mass of, ma of my mass. Note that we're also including the J2 factor, so the flattening of uh, Saturn, both for the motion of whatever moons we are putting there, and also for the motion of, of the ring. We will assume that everything happens on a plane, which is actually not the case. There is a tiny inclination, but I mean, this is okay for the beginning. <clears throat> In our approach, we will not actually fix the initial conditions of the ring particles into the ring location. We will put them as random as possible with a, uh, within certain, uh, I mean, common, uh, common region, which will be, be typically between the moons. So this is what I describe as an ensemble of non-interacting ring particles. And we will be interested in phase space region, so let me emphasize the, the part of phase space, which display certain stability conditions for the long time uh, scale. And whatever instabilities in that scale happen to appear, in a way will kick away the particles of the ring. So, we, I mean, I will have losses of particles and those particles actually will disappear and I will see the, <coughs> the black part in the pictures, in the photographs that I was displaying before. So once we have something after a very long time integrated, what it will the rings will be actually constructed simply by pro projecting from phase space into configuration space, so X and Y, the, the uh, specific uh, location in phase space of the ring particles at a given position. <coughs> so the question is, okay, what kind of moons, or what are the moons that, that we should introduce uh, here? And it is quite clear that we need uh, Prometheus and Pandora. Uh, but what else? So at the very beginning on the, of this project, we began doing only integrations, including Prometheus and Pandora, so other people have done. And it turned out that everything was sort of very steep. The integrations were not actually too long and, and were not actually showing that something like a ring was actually appearing. So we decided to include uh, another moon. This will make this some sort of restricted five-body problem. And, I mean, I will not go into the details, but at the very end we came with the idea of including Titan. <laughs> Titan is the largest moon with respect to, uh, sorry, to the mass of Saturn, but it is located pretty far away. It has one nice property, which is, I mean, one of, uh, I mean, it has some interesting eccentricity. And eccentricity is important in the sense that if whatever is being confined, we should be looking probably for some resonances, and that's a way of exciting resonance. The, the second reason was that Titan was actu actually exerting uh, a larger force than Mimas. It was more or less a factor four in the, say, uh, worst case. So Titan in its further position and Mimas in its closest uh, position to the ring. So in a, in a sense, we, we think, we thought that uh, Titan could play a, actually an important role. So this will be your model. Saturn uh, located at the origin with flattening, only J2 is considered here. We will include the gravitational uh, influence of Prometheus, Pandora, which are the shepherd moons, and also Titan. So let's see uh, how far we, we can get. Now, the subtle point I want to emphasize is that we have to somehow measure, I mean, introduce some stability indicator. And to compute uh, Lyapunov expo uh, exponent is sort of expensive in the sense that you have to, for every initial condition, you have to have a pair orbit at least. And this is, a, a you will see, a, a rather long integration. So uh, we came with the idea of merging a little bit ideas from frequency analysis and then compute variances and averages of certain quantities. So uh, mean motion frequency is one candidate, or semi-major axis will be another, of the ring particles. And then we constructed this quantity, which is the square root of the variance, divided by the, the actual uh, mean, by, uh, mean value of whatever we're computing, and this is actually an uh, a dimensional parameter. So we will 
try to use this parameter just to, to indicate us whether there is or not uh, a stability. Now, I uh, should, uh, in a way, transmit what's uh, the idea behind it. So if we would be in a, in a true quasi-periodic orbit, the variance would be average, I mean, average over zero for a very long trajectory. If we're on a chaotic region, the, uh, this variance will be somehow large. So the idea is to disti distinguish something which is very small from something which somehow is larger. And these are some results. <coughs> so this is the, the first plot I will be showing. Somewhere here it is sitting Prometheus, somewhere here it is sitting Pandora. So this is the region we are carrying. All initial conditions, which in this case were about a million or may, probably two million, were totally randomly selected with respect to the angles. We have two angles, the semi-major axis and the eccentricity in this interval. Now, you see some white uh, <coughs> regions. Those regions correspond to places where the particles have actually escaped. So, I mean, this is quite natural, very close to the, to the Sherpa moons. I mean, things will sort of collide or have a very close flyby and then eventually be, uh, uh, get away. So this is sort of actually deceiving. Uh, the the F-ring is actually located somewhere here, and this is a too wide region, much too wide. So a priori, one could throw away your model. But let me now speak about what the, this stability indicator is showing. And this is actually the color code, which is in logarithmic scale somewhere indicated here. In this case, we have used uh, the frequencies. And what you see it is that there are these strips which are extremely well localized, which happen to be the most stable uh, delta uh, frequency parameters. And then there are these very wide region where, I mean, whatever this uh, uh, stability indicator is showing mean that they are not as stable as, as this part. So from now on, I will concentrate in this place only because it is actually there that the, the, the true F-ring is located. Uh, let me simply forget the rest. <coughs> now, before uh, continuing, this is the same plot, but projected onto the angles. And what you see here it is that everything is essentially homogeneously distributed. And this is sort of counterintuitive, because the, the actual levering is inclined, and it has some apps alignment, which is actually, uh, uh, in, in a way, posing some questions. And what we see here, it is no matter what type of stability, I mean, this blauish, uh, bluish or yellowish region, they, are, they simply happen to be everywhere. There is no indication there is apps alignment in this picture. <coughs> so let's make longer and longer uh, uh, time integrations. So here we have 3.2 periods of the motion of the inner innermost moon. And these are the upper frames. And here we have 6 million uh, uh, periods of the innermost. So what you can see, it is that actually there is a lot of structure. So the, these stripes are very well located, precisely on the region where everything is observed. And that actually particles are, I mean, this white region is sort of covering slowly everything. So some of these orange uh, initial conditions, the only stable, <laughs> happen to eventually leave the region uh, in which we're interested. The histograms, uh, the, the frequency histograms here show precisely the same, but with respect, here we are plotting the, the log of the actual uh, stability in the indicator, and here is essentially the number. So you see that there is a large bunch of orange uh, particles, where there is, a, there is a smaller bunch of these bluish particles, which are the state. And if you increase the, the time integration, this large region sort of shrinks a lot, whereas this uh, bluish or uh, purple region also shrinks, but not that much. So this, in a way, I mean, these six uh, million uh, periods of the innermost moon is the longest integrations we carried on. Uh, but this indication sort of give us a bit of confidence that, or indicate, I, I mean, the, the dynamics I was trying to describe with regards to this uh, stability indicator is actually what it is happening. So, I mean, there are lots of trapped particles which 
in a way, radially can uh, have, a, uh, I mean, larger or uh, uh, migrations. And there are others which have much localized uh, uh, radial uh, diffusion. And these happen to simply fade away slowly with time. So there is another property of this picture which is very, very remarkable. And you see that actually the scale with respect to this parameter, oops, sorry, uh, it is actually quite well uh, uh, distinguished. So what we will do is actually put a filter here and simply forget all of this. In a way, time should take care about that. <coughs> So let me go a little bit fast. So this is the actual ring that we find by projecting into, into phase space at two given points. The blue curve is the actual Kepler fit for all ring particles that, that we use. And we shift that thing upwards and downwards to, to have 90% of the particles. And with that thing, we get these fitting parameters. And I wrote here also the nominal data, and you can see that the actual semi-major axis is actually quite well fit. The eccentricity is actually one order of magnitude smaller. And also, I mean, through these things, we have a, a, a very crude estimate of the width, but actually that width is compatible with some of the observations. Not with all, because the core is estimated to be in the range of 10 to 40 kilometers. So that would be a factor of 6 to, to large. Now, doing the same fit at three different times, uh, I mean three different package, uh, packets of time, we can actually see a little bit how the mean motion or the eccentricity or actually the, the perihelion is, uh, uh, is changing in time. And specifically this last picture fitting, I mean, a straight line to, I mean, this oscillating thing is sort of giving us the, uh, an estimate for the rate of precession. And this gives 2.2 degrees per day, which happens to be smaller, but within 20% of the observations. And this is, as far as I know, the first estimate based on numerical uh, computations that, are, that is being given about this quantity. Now, with regards to resonances, actually we have no idea. So uh, there are many resonances. Most green and red lines are Lindblad or co-rotation uh, resonances, which in some cases sort of meet, I mean, these histograms, which actually are the accumulation location of the rings of, uh, uh, of the, uh, that we are finding, of the particles of the ring that we are finding. There are the red li lines, which involve Pandora, the green lines, which involve Prometheus. There are the blue lines, which are mean motions, but we could not come out actually with a rule which a given resonance is sort of bounding things or a given rule that in a way applies to all of them. That could mean actually that the average is some sort of unstable altogether quantity and it is just a, time of question, uh, a question of time to, to have it all gone. So uh, I think I have two minutes left. So maybe I will stop here. Oh, so no questions then? Or? For next time. Well, I stop here and maybe take some questions so you can read the conclusions. The, maybe the, the, the striking point I would like to emphasize is that this is actually a very simple model. And despite of that, it seems that we have actually a good correspondence, at least with some of the data, which, which has been observed. And I would like especially to emphasize that uh, the apps precession is within 20% of the, of the observed one. And with that, uh, I think I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question, so I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this histogram in blue is without Titan. And this histo histogram, uh, I mean, in bold, whatever color it is, <coughs> it is with Titan. So, what you can see here, it is two, th two things. In the region of stability, there is no much uh, change. However, in the region of unstability, there is actually this shrink, uh, shrink cache. So less particles, <coughs> so you have more stable, uh, unstable air, whatever. Uh, more or less? 
so, I mean, uh, Titan has induced instability in such a way that you have less particles. So without Titan, you have more on, on stabler, uh, whatever what would be the, the correct English way of, of saying it, uh, but I'm not sure whether it is clear. The point is that this difference means that particles have go away. So in a way, it is unstable. <coughs> Last one. <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Uh, I didn't see solar radiation pressure. And there is no solar radiation pressure, yeah. effects that should uh, greatly affect the structures of the ring. Well, I guess that the argument not to include those uh, those um, those things it is because of the size or the uh, estimated size of of the particles of the ring there. So they are not in the range of microns, they are on the sub-centimeter case, so maybe millimeters, up to kilometers. So, yeah, I didn't say so, but uh, this ring actually lies just beyond the, 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 the Roche radius, so it is actually, I mean, a, a strongly dynamical object. So there was, I think, a okay. question somewhere. Yes, yeah, yes. at the beginning <laughs> you showed uh, your main plot and said it much wider than the real ring. No. There were some uh, stable blue regions on the right hand side, a bit more. And there are no particles there. Even if uh, as I mean, as observations are concerned, so real astronomy, no. So, if uh, I think that, I mean, the, the, the model in a way is too simple, maybe, to account for that part. But yes, I mean, we found also these very stable orbits uh, towards Pandora, which is not, uh, ha at least, has not been observed. Okay, let's postpone the other question for the coffee break. Thank you very much again.